Hey guys, <clears throat> we went down at 13. What happened? Pray for the buffering to go away in Jesus' name. So hopefully we'll, we'll get the same crowd we got last time for the Quran. Right? Hey, Caldena Sarah, what's up, brother? Hope you guys enjoyed the previous session, huh? You were here. Sargon David, I think, was here too. But he's not here yet. We'll see if he comes back. What did you guys think of that session? I mean, first and the last, first and the last, and Protestant believer, you had already heard this. Heard this. We already went through this on Discord, right? So this wasn't new to you guys, but it's good to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. If you have your YouTube channels, download them to your YouTube channels. Go to the blog. Use the articles. Download them to your websites. The articles, you have my permission. Print them out. As long as you're not selling them, freely you receive, freely you shall give, right? Chaldean, we're all struggling with the flesh, brother. You're struggling with something that's common to all men. A young man who's not married, who struggles. Just trust the Holy Spirit. Try to fast more. Try to sing more praises. Pray more. Don't leave yourself <clears throat> idle. Get active and ask Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to direct you to that right one if he wants you to get married. But don't rush. Don't rush. Who's in a good mood today? I don't know. I don't know. So you're struggling with... Uh, Chaldean Assyrian, what's common to all men? I don't know of a single man, even sisters, but it's, I believe, common more with men, that area. We all struggle, brother. I'm 47 years old and I'm a bachelor again, in the sense that, you know, not married. I struggle too. And I ask Jesus Christ for mercy. I ask the Holy Spirit to fill me, to give me power to conquer my flesh, and that when I do fail, that He has mercy on me and forgive me and not punish me in Jesus' name. The Lord knows us better than we do without trying to justify our sin because we have to hate sin and war against sin. But the Lord knows until Christ comes down <clears throat> or we die, we have a sinful inclination in our flesh that wars with us. And it won't leave us alone until the flesh is dead or transformed at Jesus' return from heaven. So this is your battle. This is your struggle. This is your cross. Don't succumb to it willfully, fight it, but at the same time, but at the same time, right? Don't let your struggles discourage you and push you away from Christ because that's what Satan wants. Satan wants you to feel so guilty and worthless that you stop praying and reading scripture because that's your weapons against him. And if you're not engaging your weapons, you're going to become spiritually weak, and then you're going to fall completely and go back to your former way of life. And that's what Satan's trying to do. Plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Cry out to Jesus for mercy and love. And he loves you more than you know, and he'll forgive you. All right? So don't make an excuse to sin, but don't get to the point where you despair because of sin. Be balanced and trust the Holy Spirit to fill you, right? In Jesus' name. And that's our uh, everyone's battle, Chaldean. There's not a day I don't struggle, brother. Carnal desires, because again, that's why, why do you think I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give me the gift of celibacy? Because I'm not looking to get married, because I really have a hard time trusting these days, marriage, the way it is. But the Holy Spirit knows I struggle. I burn and I ask him to give me the grace to overcome, right? It's a battle for me. And at the same time, I don't have my daughters and that's hell for me, loneliness. <clears throat> but this is our cross and he's worthy. And what you're carrying and I'm carrying, Although it seems a lot, don't forget, there are brothers and sisters right now, as we speak of, in China, Pakistan, India, Muslim lands, who are being beaten, who are being tortured, who are being imprisoned, if not killed, whose children are being taken into slavery, and they're still staying strong by the power of the Holy Spirit and not denying Jesus Christ. 
right? So let's stay strong. Welcome. Hopefully we'll get about 160 like we did in the previous session because I want to see more people coming when we discuss core doctrines of the Christian faith than they do for a topic on Islam, right? Last session we had close to 170 because it's the Quran, right? <clears throat> but I want more people to show up for my streams on Jesus, on the Bible, on the doctrines of the faith. This is why I spent over 90% of my time talking about Christian topics. But I have noticed that if you talk about Islam, you get people coming out of the woodworks because topics on Islam don't just attract Christians. It attracts atheists, agnostics, and secularists. And I want to educate them too. But at the end of the day, I want all atheists, agnostics, secularists, Hindus, everyone to fall in love with the true God who is real, who does exist, the true God revealed in Jesus Christ. All right. So let's pray. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, I ask you bless this session like you did the previous one. Anoint, <clears throat> anoint us and fill us with the Spirit. And Father, fill my throat, my lungs, my chest with the breath of life. Health from your Holy Spirit, the health I need to glorify you. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. And empower me by your spirit to recall and interpret scriptures correctly and perfectly. And wash my motives, my heart, and the blood of Jesus. Not to do it for the praise of men. Not to do it for fame or fortune. But to do it for the glory of Jesus. And save me from being unnecessarily offensive. And bless everyone here, Father. And those who will hear in the future. Bless everyone with wisdom and knowledge and life and power and love from your Holy Spirit. That through my meager efforts, your spirit will be pleased to take us to higher levels of love, to love you more passionately, to serve you more faithfully, to know you more intimately, and to be bold as lions and lionesses, proclaiming the word, living the word, loving the word, and dying for the word. For your word is truth. The Bible is your word, and Jesus is the living word whom we love and adore. Save us from attacks on the enemy and bless our loved ones, Father. Bless my daughters and seal them by the Spirit and provide for them overabundantly and bring them to me to raise them in the love of Jesus. And speak to them and let them know that their earthly Baba loves them and can't wait to see them. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. And Father, if you want me to do ministry, stir up hearts to bless this ministry for the provisions needed. You don't need me. They don't need me. We need you. Be glorified. We love you. We adore you in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Thank you for coming for the second session. As you can say, I'm not, see, I'm not young anymore. I'm 47. I remember when I was 20, I could speak like six, seven hours. But now you can see my throat, right? <clears throat> I should have brought some water. It's okay. May the Holy Spirit rehydrate me for his glory. Right? So amen, amen. Praying for your sister, Shani. I have a sister named Shani. You guys are confusing me. Who's I have a sister named Shani? Really? Oh, oh. Who's sister Shani? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Razi. I thought they were talking to me. In Jesus' name, Razzles, may the stripes of Jesus Christ heal Shani of her cancer. By the blood of Jesus, may she be whole. Right? The stripes of Jesus make her whole. And may the blood of Jesus cover us. Stripes of Jesus make us whole spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, for his glory in Jesus' name. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't know because if someone said Shani, I said, man, I didn't know. I, well, I do have a sister in Christ named Shani now, but I didn't know. I'm like, really? I have a biological sister separated at birth? No one told me? All right. And you know what? There's another prayer request. Please let's pray. For a young boy who's going to have surgery to remove a tumor from his brain in Jesus' name, right? His father's name is Shiner. Pray for a Shiner. Pray for a son that in Jesus' name, the Lord Jesus will destroy that tumor in his brain by the fire of the Holy Spirit. And that that surgery will be perfectly successful and extend that boy's earthly life in Jesus' name. So thank you, guys. This is now the new year. Here's what I want you to do for me. You know, covenant with me. Pray for me and my daughters, fast for me and my daughters, that God will save me from these shackles, from this corrupt system, and give me the freedom to serve him without fear, to glorify the Lord. Pray for the provisions to come in. Pray I get healthier if the Lord is pleased to keep me around. 
better to be with Jesus than on earth. As long as I die covered by the blood of Jesus, sealed by the Spirit, it's much better. But if he wants me around to give me the health and to give me the holiness, to delight his heart, to be a doer of the word, to know the word, live it out, and glorify Christ. And guys, do pray for the provisions. Again, I want to thank every one of you. Had it not been for the brothers and sisters praying for me and the brothers and sisters supporting me via Patreon, I couldn't do the ministry, right? And if God wants me to do ministry, he'll provide. If not, that's okay. He doesn't need me. We'll do something else. But I want to thank you guys again for partnering with me via Patreon and PayPal. Uh, this month, I saw that some of the supporters dropped. The support was a little less, and I, and I understand why, because it's Christmas and New Year's. But pray if God wants me in ministry to raise up more people to partner with me, not less, right? Like I said, we don't do this for money, but again, if the Lord wants us to do it, he'll stir up people's hearts to partner with us. So pray for that. Pray for that, that it'll spread out. If God wants to use me, and honestly, and I mean this, and I'm not just saying this, I know the Lord doesn't need me in ministry. If he wants to use me, it is an honor to be used of the Lord. Sometimes I do more damage than good. So pray for that provision. And Lord willing, in due course, I'm going to change the name of the Patreon page. I'm going to change it to Christ for the World Ministries, an LLC business, right? It's, it's, it's not a business, but I, I need to do that for, you know, to protect myself and my kids. So hopefully when that happens, the people who are contributing will switch over to that. You know, and I don't want to be a burden, but still I need to. So pray for that. Pray for everything. Go smooth this year, right? All right. So pray for that, guys. And again, I want to thank you guys who've been praying for me. I want to thank you guys who've been supporting me on Patreon. I will reach out to you, all of you. And those of you who can't support financially, don't feel bad. I love you the same because you are supporting me through your prayers and by watching these. So what I need you to do is hit the like button, watch this video and the other videos, study the arguments, please. Study these arguments. Absorb the arguments, understand them, and use them and proclaim them. That's how you're going to bless me. If you take this information, become more knowledgeable about the faith, and fall more in love with Jesus because of the increased knowledge that the Spirit has been giving us, and then using it in evangelism to declare spiritual warfare in the kingdom of darkness, then I've succeeded as a teacher of the Holy Spirit. Because every teacher raised up by the Spirit wants to see people know their faith, love their faith, be sold out for their faith, zealous for their faith, proclaim their faith, live the faith, and die for the faith, faith in Jesus Christ. And if that's the fruit of my teaching, I am blessed. So please, you have my permission, download these videos to your YouTube channel. Pass them out. You can even take clips. Cut these videos in short clips. Post them on your YouTube channel. Go to my blog and my websites. Download the articles to your websites, but do not sell them and keep the name of the author. So, you know, not because I want praise and attention. No, but just, you know, do that. Print them out. Use them in your Bible studies, in your Sunday schools, in your church. Service. That's why we're doing this. So you can become warriors in the battlefield. We need more soldiers, please. And I want to thank you guys who are here because you are soldiers. That's why you're here. And I want to also especially thank... Protestant believer, first and last, and the other admins for help me to help you for the glory of Christ. Now that said, in Jesus' name, Lord, bring that 200 to hear about your glory. This is the third part in my series on whose glory did the prophet Isaiah see? If you go back, you got to listen to the two previous sessions because I'm going to be building on those two previous sessions. I don't want to keep repeating material I've already covered because then we're going to be here till the rapture. And hopefully the rapture happens, happens today. Please, Lord. Maranatha, come when we're clothed by, by your spirit, washed in your blood, Lord Jesus. And I pray that now we're cleansed by your blood. Come now, Lord. Let's get out of here. This wicked world. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have mercy on this. All right. Let's continue where we left off. I'm going to give further proof that according to the gospel of John, and you got to hear those two previous sessions, folks. Jesus is the Jehovah God whose glory Abraham saw. Moses saw, Isaiah saw, Jeremiah saw, all of them saw the glory of Jesus, the eternal word, the eternal son, before he became man. Because apart from Jesus, no one can have access to the Father. Apart from Jesus, no one can know the Father and have a relationship with the Father. 
And that includes the Old Testament. I love this guy, Phantom. I think you're the gentleman that put in my comment section, you should call this Shemunian Wagyu Steakhouse because a lot of meat. And by the way, I guess Wagyu is a steakhouse in your area because this is the first time I've heard of Wagyu. God bless you. Thank you for encouraging words, brother. Uh, really, I was laughing. But I, I've never heard of Wagyu, right? So now let's get into the meat of the matter. Let's now look at, we'll probably do two, yeah, two examples from Isaiah again. How John 12, 41, let's look at John 12, 41 again. John 12, 41. And by the way, here's my article. I'm basing th these series pretty much on this article. So save the link, study it, and use it. Well, that just tells you that I'm a poor apologist because I've never had Wagyu. Rias, but it means you're rich because you know Wagyu is the expensive, high-quality type of meat. That means you're rolling in the money, brother. You're right. You're rolling in the dough, baby. Send some dough this way to the ministry. You know, don't be penny pinching. All right, John, John 12, 41. Notice what he says. Pray for the buffering to stop in Jesus' name because the internet connection is not the best here. John 12, 41. Again, we already went through this. I'm not going to repeat what I've discussed in the two previous sessions. But notice it says, these things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. So John says, when Isaiah saw Jehovah appearing in visible shape in Isaiah 6, sitting on a throne. That's when Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. Because John is telling you the Jehovah that Isaiah saw was Jesus Christ in his preeminent existence. And I gave you the evidence, the irrefutable exegetical evidence from John that you can't get around this. If you're honest to God, honest to Scripture, and you're not demonized or an agent of Satan, who can't allow God to be who he is and must pervert the scripture to deny what the Bible teaches. There's no way around the plain teaching of the God-breathed scriptures. Jesus is the Jehovah God that Isaiah saw in visible glory in Isaiah 6. No way around it. I'm not saying people won't deny it and try to get around it, but that's just a sign. They're demonized and they belong to the devil until Christ grants them repentance leading to life. Because those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, it's right there. In front of your face. But now let's give some more further proof. Further proof that John depicts Jesus as that Jehovah God Almighty whose glory the Old Testament saints saw. You ready? Let's go to John 1, 14 and 15. John 1, 14 and 15. There's a lot of meat in here too. Right? So let's unpack it. Trusting the Spirit to guide me to speak truth without error. And by the way, folks, I have it here. Let me recommend it. The revised, updated edition of this book came out. Let me post it here. Okay. Let's see. Hold on. The Forgotten Trinity by J Dr. James R. White. Here it goes. The Forgotten Trinity by Dr. James R. White. This is the revised, updated edition. Recovering the Heart of Christian Belief. This book... Must reading, superb book for the beginning intermediate stages of the apologists and students of the Bible. If you want an excellent book on the Trinity. Remind me to talk about this more as I'm about to conclude because I want to go into the meat of the matter, but you got to get this. But please don't let, don't let me shut down the session without talking about why you got to get this book. Look, it's not that book, big, full of meat. Talk about Wagyu Steakhouse. It's right here. You know, I've gotten about like 10 million con uh, confirmations. I should write a book. Can you pray for that? That if God wants me to write the definitive book on refuting Islam and expounding these core doctrines of the Christian faith, that the provision will be there so I can have an abundance of provision, not to worry about bills, so I can just focus on writing that book. Okay? So right now, it's not the time because I got some financial tribulations that I need God to get me out of. So pray for that, and I'll do it. Because they say at the mouth of two or three witnesses, I've gotten about 10 million. Obviously, I'm exaggerating, hyperbole, but I've gotten dozens and dozens and dozens of people saying, you got to write a book. And I have to take that and believe that's God telling me, you're going to need to write a book before you leave this earth. But guys, pray. I need the finances so I don't have to worry about, you know, bills, honestly. And it's not, not going to use it to bait you, right? But it's, it's the truth. 
Unfortunately, we live in a world, nothing is free. The only free thing is where you get people to accuse you falsely and get a corrupt system to punish you. That doesn't cost you anything, meaning to get in trouble, right? Getting out of trouble costs you something. But John 1, 14 and 15. John 1, 14 and 15. Yeah, let's read. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now pay attention. The word is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He became flesh. I'm going to talk about the word dwelt among us. I'm going to talk about what that word dwelt means, right, in a minute. But pay attention when he says, when he became flesh, he dwelt among us. And that's when we beheld his glory. We saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, now John 1.15, he now mentions the witness of the Baptist. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. I'll revisit the testimony of the Baptist in a minute, but there's nothing coincidental in the way John composed the gospel. The Spirit guided John to compose the gospel in such a manner to make the deity of Christ crystal clear and to connect Jesus with the Jehovah of the Old Testament. Let me show you what I mean. The verb dwelt among us, dwelt among us. If you go back and look at the Greek, eskinosin. Let me get you the interlinear so you know I'm not making it up. Let me get you the first. Let me give you the link to my article. You guys know this already. I'm preaching to the choir. But it's good to hear things repetitively until it becomes second nature. Now, let me get you the interlinear so you can read the Greek in transliteration if you can't read the Greek itself. Thank God for modern technology to make learning easier and fun so we have no excuse for being biblically illiterate like David Wood. Okay. Biblically illiterate like David Wood. Okay, here you go. Thank you, brother. He beat me to it. Okay. If you go and look at the Greek word for dwelt, right? Eskinosin, and I'm butchering the Greek, dwelt. Eskinosin. If you click on it, you're going to be taken to Strong's 4637, skinao, skinao, okay, skinao. Now, this is the verbal form of the noun skine, skine. Now, I'll tell you why this is important, skine. Remember I said in the previous session that John assumes that his Greek readers, because John has written in Greek, that those reading his gospel in Greek would be familiar with the Greek Old Testament, the Greek version of the Old Testament. Okay, now why is that important? Because this word, skine, appears in the Greek Old Testament. And it's the word used to translate the tent of meeting. And it's the word used to translate tabernacle. In other words, skine was the word used to translate those texts where Moses, as well as Solomon, pitched a tent a tabernacle, a temple for God to dwell in. The word skene refers to the tent, the tabernacle, the temple that God dwelt in and which he filled with his glory. And I'll prove it to you in a minute. Let's look at John 1.14 one more time. John 1.14 one more time. You're going to see where I'm going with this and what John is doing. John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and we dwelt and dwelt among us. Now notice after he says he the Greek word eskinosin literally is, and he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent among us. He pitched his temple among us. He pitched his tabernacle among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So John is assuming that his Greek readers would pick up on these words and tie it in with the Old Testament. What John is saying is that the physical flesh body of Jesus, his physical body, has now become the physical tent, the physical tabernacle, the physical temple that houses the fullness of God and the fullness of his glory. I'm about to block this, this dog who's uh, not listening but just distracting. Everyone with me? Those of you who are paying attention? John is saying Jesus' flesh is the physical tent, 
the physical temple, the physical tabernacle that now houses the fullness of deity, the fullness of God's glory. Okay, That's why it says we beheld his glory after he became flesh and made the flesh, the tent, the tabernacle, the temple that houses the glory of God. Now, let's go to Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Exodus 33, verses 7 to 11. Watch here. You see, see what John's going to do. Pray. We got to get about 200, man. We're down only at 86. For the Islamic one, we had about 160. Ah, oh, Christians. Exodus 33, 7 to 11. Now, read with me. And Moses took the tabernacle. Folks, guess what the word tabernacle is in Greek? Not Hebrew. When they translate in Greek, guess what it is? And Moses took the skene, same word, and pitched it. And without the camp, right, outside the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. Congregation. Guess what the word tabernacle in Greek is? Skene. And it came to pass that everyone which sought Jehovah went out unto the tabernacle, the Greek translation, skene, of the congregation which was without the camp. And it came to pass that when Moses went out and unto the tabernacle, skene, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door, tent is skene, and looked after Moses and until he was gone into the tabernacle. Now watch what happens. Verse 10. Verse 9, I'm sorry. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, entered into the skene, the cloudy pillar, that visible cloud, the pillar of cloud that they saw, they saw a cloud shaped like a pillar visibly, and God was in that cloud directing it. So that cloudy pillar descended, stood at the door of the tabernacle, and Jehovah talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Okay, now, first slide just posted Exodus 33, 7. Here is the word. It's tain. Skinning in the accusative. There it is right there. I'm going to transliterate. Okay. And skinning. Accusative of skinning from where we get skinao. Got it? The same word in John 1 14, but in the verbal form. When Jesus became flesh, that flesh became the tabernacle. Is the same word used here. Are you making the connection what John is doing? Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. Then a cloud covered the tent. Guess what the Greek word for tent is? Skinne, the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord Jehovah filled the tabernacle. Sound familiar? The tent and filled with glory. The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Can you send this filthy barking dog to his female dog mother? Yep. Sorry, guys. When you got wicked, filthy dogs blasphemy, I send them to their mothers. Because they're upset that their mother doesn't know who fathered them. But focus in Jesus' name. Exodus 40, 34. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, filled the skinne. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord, the glory of Yehovah, Jehovah, filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were, were not taken up, then they... Journey not till the day that it was taken up for the cloud of Jehovah was upon the tabernacle by day and fire was on it by night in the sight of the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Guys, did you make the connection? The tabernacle, Greek, skinne, filled with the glory of Jehovah. Can you post the Greek for us first and last? You did 34. Here it goes. Can you repost it? Okay, watch here. I'm going to give it to you in transliteration. Ten skinane. 
Now watch the what the word glory is. Yeah, you're not transliterating uh, first and last. You assume that people can read Greek like you because you're special. Doxes kiriu. K doxes kiriu. Here you go. Okay, let me transliterate. Hold on. Okay, there you go. So you see, it's tain skinane doxes kiriu. Okay, the glory of the Lord, right? Let's look at John 1 14 in the Greek. Can you post the Greek? I'm going to give you the link for the interlinear again. Post the Greek for me first and last, if you don't mind. Hold on. Here is the link. Now watch the Greek. Yes, I do, brother. It's the same uh, email. Guys, pay attention. Here it goes. It says K or Kai, if you want to do Raspian way. Halogos, Sarks, Agenita. K or Kai. Eskinosin. Here it goes. Here, I'm going to now give it to you so you guys see. Okay. I'm going to transliterate. Eskinosin from Skina O, which is from Skin A. Okay, now, now notice the other part. It says, and they they beheld his glory. Notice it's Tain Doxain. You understand anyone reading John in Greek and knows the Old Testament in Greek, they would see the connection. You know what John just told his Greek readers? You know what John just told his Greek readers? Jesus' physical body is the new tent, the new temple, the new tabernacle that is filled with the essence of God, that which makes God God, dwells in his physical body, and it's filled with the glory of God. In other words, you don't need the temple in Jerusalem because you have the living, abiding temple of God in the flesh body of Jesus. That's what he just told you. And so when you, say, when you see Jesus, you're seeing the glory of Jehovah manifested visibly. You understand what John just told his Greek readers that are reading it in Greek and know the Greek Old Testament? I hope it sunk in. I want you to see how amazing this Bible is, how amazing our God is, how amazing Jesus is, and who Jesus really is. He's no creature. He's God Almighty of the Old Testament who became flesh and blood human being by taking on a physical body, human nature, from the blessed womb, of his consecrated blessed mother while she was a virgin in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that Jesus is alive. He's real. He is life. He's not make-believe. Is it sinking in? And you're trying to tell me that the gospel of John is not presenting the Trinity, that God is triune, and that Jesus is God in the flesh. Yeah, I'm convinced. Yep, I'm a believer. I'm ready to become a Unitarian or Joe Witness or... A Mohammedan. To further prove that Jesus' physical body is being presented as the physical temple, tent, tabernacle of God Almighty, who dwells in it in all his fullness. Let's go to John 2, 19 to 22. John 2, 19 to 22. I don't know what you mean, rather large thought, but yes. John 2, 19 to 22. Jesus answered, said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Notice he's talking about a temple that God lives in. Then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in building, and thinking the temple in Jerusalem. And wilt thou, you, rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. There you go, from the mouth of our Lord Jesus. My physical body is the temple of God. You destroy it, I will raise it up as God's everlasting temple. And three days. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Is there, is there any doubt from Jesus' own mouth now 
My physical body is the physical temple in which all the fullness of God lives in it because I am God dwelling in this physical body in all my fullness. See what he just said? Okay, now, remember in Exodus 33, 7 to 11, and Exodus 40, 34, 38, what descended upon the tent, what appeared right by the tent's door? A cloud, right? A pillar of cloud by day, which was a pillar of fire by night, right? A cloud came on the tent, right? And Jehovah was in that cloud, right? You got it, right? Now let's read Mark 9, 7. Mark 9, 7. Because people leave it's the earliest gospel. Let's go to Mark 9, 7. Oh, wait, you know what? Let's read Mark 9, 2 to 7. Mark 9, 2 to 7. I think it's born. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Did you see what came upon Jesus? The cloud. The same cloud that filled the tent, the tabernacle, the temple, is now filling Jesus in the presence of his three disciples as Moses and Elijah are there. Coincidence? Coincidence? Mark 9, 2 to 7. After six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, leadeth them up unto a high mountain, apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Wow, so Moses is there, even Elijah. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. Hmm, tabernacle, the word tabernacle. Hmm, there you go again. One for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist, did not know what he was saying, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud. Wow. What's going on here? A cloud overshadowed them, came upon them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. So a cloud comes upon Jesus, Peter, James, and John, with Moses and Elijah there. Peter mentions tabernacles. John tells us the physical body of Jesus is a physical tabernacle of God. And in the Old Testament, that tabernacle, that tent, and the temple that Solomon built, the cloud appeared and filled it as a sign that this house is now filled with the glory of God. And you're still trying to tell me that the Gospels do not present Jesus as God Almighty in the flesh with his physical body being the physical temple that houses the fullness of God and all his glory. Yep, exactly, Bill Thompson. Luke 135. Luke 135. Let's read it since you mentioned it. Watch here. Because he mentioned Bill Thompson said overshadow. We heard that word lately with Mary. Here's where you heard it. And the angel answered, said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Do you know why the power overshadowed her? Because it was from her body that God took his physical tabernacle, his tent. So Mary conceived the physical building, the physical tabernacle, the physical tent of Jehovah God Almighty, who dwelt in it in all his fullness. Hmm. Is it sinking in? Before I move on, I'm trying to give you a minute to let it simmer and sink in. Why aren't you? Right? Sink in? Have I have I lost anyone on the way? Are you seeing the depth, the beauty, the meat of the scriptures, particularly the Gospel of John? From chapter 1, he's introduced the Trinity to you and that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty, 
distinct from the Father and the Spirit, yet all together they are the one God. From the very first chapter he does this. Right? So if we got that part, notice that after he says we beheld his glory, he mentioned John the Baptist. Let's look at John 1, 14 and 15 again. John 1, 14 and 15 again. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now, two things I want you to know. Yep, the Bible is a living book because it's the word of God, and the word of God is living, not static, not dead. It is a living book because it's God's living word and scripturated, right? Enlivened by the spirit that produced it. Now, pay attention. It's not a coincidence that John says we beheld his glory. Do you understand why? And he mentioned John the Baptist in a minute. Uh, I'll get back to that. I want you to compare John 12, 41 and John 1, 14 together. See, I'm trying to make all these connections for you guys. Okay. John 1, 14, we beheld his glory. We beheld the glory of Jesus. The glory that's of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Compare that to what he said about Isaiah, John 12, 41. Yeah, can someone really quickly check Dus Vult in Latin, what it means? If he's blaspheming, I'm going to insult his mother for giving birth to a dog if he's blaspheming. If he's praising God, then he's okay. Pay attention now. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. And John says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. You understand what John is telling you? John is telling you, I, like Isaiah, beheld the glory of Jesus. Like Isaiah before me saw the glory of Jesus, I too saw the glory of Jesus. So I am part of that blessed company that saw the glory of Jesus visibly. Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus when he appeared visibly in visible form in Isaiah 6. And I saw the glory of Jesus visibly when he actually became a human being and took on a human nature and was born as a human babe. You caught it? You guys made the connection? Isaiah before me saw the glory of Jesus when Jesus wasn't a man yet, but appeared in visible shape, and I beheld the glory of Jesus after he became man. So what connects me to Isaiah is this. We both saw Jesus' visible glory. He saw his visible glory before he became man. I saw his visible glory when he became man. And did you notice he connects John the Baptist after saying, I beheld his glory. We beheld his glory and then John the Baptist. Let me show you why that's important. Let's see what John the Baptist says about himself. John 1, 23. We're almost done. John 1, 23. Watch what John the Baptist says. John the Baptist says that he's the one Isaiah 40 prophesied. He, John the Baptist in context said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So notice John the Baptist says, I am the one that Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 40, verse 3. There, Isaiah spoke of a voice crying out in the wilderness. I am that voice. I'm here to fulfill what Isaiah said. I am the voice, the emissary, the emerald, sent, the envoy sent by God to be a voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the coming of God. Now, Here's where you're going to get blown away. Here's where I need Protestant believer to post Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5, back to back with John 1, 14 to 15, and John 1, 23. So let me give you the sequence. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5, then John 1, 14 to 15, and then John 1, 23. And see what John said about Jesus. See what John does here okay 
Watch here. Just be patient. Don't text yet. Watch. Now watch. Let's see how many of you are going to catch it when he posts it. Phantom, take it easy, buddy. I know it's parallel. Just wait. Don't break the flow of the context of the verses. Okay. Now let's read. Thank our the help here. Protestant, first, last, Riaz, Angel, Angela, everyone. Read with me. Isaiah 40, 3 to 5, the prophecy. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. John the Baptist says, I'm him. I'm that voice that Isaiah said would come. In the wilderness, crying out. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The voice is going to tell the people, get ready for the Lord Jehovah. He's coming. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He's not preparing for a creature. He's preparing for our God, Jehovah. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. Now pay attention. Verse 5. Watch the connection. And the glory of Jehovah shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. After John the Baptist cries out in the wilderness, preparing people for Jehovah, then the glory of Jehovah will be seen and mankind will behold it. The glory of Jehovah shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it all together before the mouth of Jehovah has spoken it. Now let's see if you make the connection. John 1, 14 to 15. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory of Jehovah shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it. We beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bear witness of him and cry, a voice crying in the wilderness, saying, this was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. John 1, 23. John the Baptist said, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. Who caught it? Who caught what John the evangelist did, what Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 5? Isaiah predicted a voice will be crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of Jehovah. Make a highway for our God. This voice will come and prepare people for the coming of God. After he shows up, God will show up in his glory, and everyone's going to see the glory of God. John 1 said, that voice is John the Baptist. That voice in the wilderness that's crying out is John the Baptist. John the Baptist has come. That means he's preparing for Jehovah, for our God to show up in his glory. But the one who shows up is Jesus. And when Jesus shows up, John the evangelist says, we beheld the glory of Jesus. No, there is no Malachi 3.1. And there is no I am. You guys are not paying attention if you're bringing up irrelevant passages to John 1. John the evangelist just told you the Jehovah God whose glory all flesh would see after the voice cries out in the wilderness, preparing people for the coming of their God is none other than Jesus Christ. When we beheld the glory of Jesus, we beheld the glory of Jehovah because he is Jehovah, our God who is coming. Letting it sink in. Deuce Volt, ask me such relevant questions. I'm going to send you back to mommy. She obviously didn't wean you enough. Okay. So let's connect the dots again. John the Baptist is the voice crying out in the wilderness of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. He is the voice that Isaiah said God would send as his herald. And when he shows up, he'll prepare people for the coming of Jehovah God, our God. Send Deuce on his merry way. Send this barking moron out of here. Okay? You with me there? Isaiah, who's coming? A voice will be coming in the wilderness. What is he going to do, Isaiah? He's going to announce to people, make a way for Jehovah, make a highway for our God, because our God is coming. We're going to see his glory. John. Who's that voice that Isaiah said would come? Oh, that's the Baptist. Hold on, John. But the Baptist was sent to prepare for who? Jesus. But wait, John. 
Isaiah says, that voice whom you say is the Baptist is preparing people for the coming of our God, for the coming of Jehovah, and they're going to see the glory of Jehovah after he shows up, the voice shows up. Yeah, that's true. But you just said John the Baptist is preparing for Jesus, and Jesus showed up right after John. Yeah. What are you trying to tell me, John the Evangelist? I'm trying to tell you what I've been trying to tell you in all these chapters. Jesus is the Jehovah God of Isaiah. So when I saw the glory of Jesus, I was seeing the glory of Jehovah because Isaiah said, we're going to see the glory of Jehovah when Jehovah shows up and he showed up and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. You got it now? And just to prove that John the Baptist is preparing for Jesus. Let's read John 1. Let's read John 1. Okay. 26 to 36. John 1, 26 to 36. They try to explain it away, Anna, growing. They say, well, it's not really God, but a spokesperson, an agent of God, because they can't handle the literalness of these passages. Right, But John 1, 26, 36, guides read, Jim's, Jim's read. If there's any doubt that John the Baptist is praying for Jesus, and therefore Jesus is the Jehovah God of Isaiah, whose glory all flesh would see, let's read. John 1, 26 to 36, let's read. God answered them saying, I baptize you with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He's already here. He's in your midst. He's here already, but you don't know him yet. It is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I'm not worthy to loose. It was the function of servants to loosen the sandals of those coming into the home, especially the master, and provide water to wash their feet. He's saying, I'm not even good enough to do that because I'm not good enough to be a slave. That's how great this one is. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Though he comes after me, he's older than me. He exists before me because he is the Jehovah, our God, whose glory we're supposed to see. That's why I'm not worthy to be a slave. No one is good enough to be the slave of God. And here's God in the flesh. You're seeing his glory in the flesh. Now let's read. That was John 1.30. Let's read. 31. And I know him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I coming, come baptizing with water. Now watch. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Right? And again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus, as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Okay, let's unpack this. John the Baptist is the voice crying out in the wilderness that Isaiah said over 700 years beforehand would cry out in the wilderness, preparing people for the coming of Jehovah, making a highway for the appearance of our God. Once he shows up, right after him, our God would show up, the God of Israel would show up, Jehovah would show up, and all flesh would see the glory of Jehovah. But then John the Baptist tells us, I am sent to prepare for Jesus. Here is Jesus. Here's the one I was sent to prepare for. But wait, John, you just said you're the voice of Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. Yeah, but I just read the prophecy, John the Baptist. Okay, there it says you're going to prepare for our God, the God of Israel, for the coming of Jehovah. And the glory that all flesh would see is the glory of Jehovah. Yes, absolutely right. But you just said Jesus is the Lamb of God, 
the son of God. And as the lamb, he takes away the sin of the world. He's older than you. You're not good enough to be a slave. He baptized with the Holy Spirit. So you've, you're, 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 you're preparing for Jesus. Yes. But he's the son of God. Yes. So God is his father. Yes. And he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Yes. So he's not God the Father. No. And he's not the Holy Spirit. No. He's the son of God. Yes. And he gives the Holy Spirit. Yes. But he's also that Jehovah who's Israel's God, whose glory all flesh would behold. Right? Yes. So wait, John. You're proclaiming the Trinity? Yeah. What do you think I was, a Unitarian? Oh, you're not a Unitarian? No, where'd you get that from? Because he's the Lamb of God. Yes, yeah, so he's distinct from God, right? He's God's provision, sacrificial provision of sin. Yes, so he's distinct from God, right, Baptist? Yeah, and he's the Son of God, right? Yeah, so God is his Father, yeah. So he's not God the Father, no? And then he baptized with the Holy Spirit, right? Yes, and the Holy Spirit came upon him, right? So he's not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. One, two, three. But at the same time, John the Baptist, you're the voice of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Yes? But you are crying out in the wilderness, telling people, hey, Jehovah's coming. Get ready. Our God is going to show up, and we're going to see the glory of Jehovah. Absolutely. But you just said that's Jesus. Yeah. So you're saying Jesus is that Jehovah of Isaiah 40? Yeah. So he's Israel's God, yes, and yet Israel's God is the Son of God, yes, and he gives the Holy Spirit, yes, so he's not the Holy Spirit, no, and you are a Trinitarian? Well, what does it sound like? Sounds like I'm a Jehovah Witness? No. Sounds like I'm a Mormon? No. Sounds like I'm a Unitarian? No. Sounds like I'm a modalist? Absolutely not. So wait, John the Baptist was a Trinitarian, an experiential Trinitarian who heard the Father audibly commissioning him, who saw the Holy Spirit come down in visible shape, saw him visibly, and beheld Jehovah God of Israel in the flesh as Jesus of Nazareth, an experiential Trinitarian. Hmm. But you're still trying to convince me that the Gospel of John doesn't teach the Trinity, that the Old Testament saints, of whom John is the finality of the Old Testament period, were not Trinitarians, and Jesus is not Jehovah God, but a man, or the Archangel Michael, or that God is not a Trinity, but three manifestations. King of kings, show me where it says angels have a divine nature. Show me that, please. Now, why would you let the Muslims give you such a pathetic argument? Because you're not simply arguing that Jesus has a divine nature, but that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh. So it's not simply divine. He's divine in the same sense that Jehovah is divine because he's Jehovah in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. So why would you let them get away with such a pathetic Straw man. Okay, everyone with me so far? Now let me show you that John the Baptist is the end of the Old Testament era. His coming signifies the ending of the Old Testament era and the start of the New Testament era. Did you guys know that? John the Baptist is the termination, the end of the Old Testament era, and he ushers in the New Testament era. Luke 16, 16. You did, King of Kings. You did a good job. Luke 16, 16. Well, we're almost done. The law and the prophets were until John. Did you catch it? So the Old Testament era lasts up until John the Baptist. Since that time... Since the time that John came and prepared for Jesus, the kingdom of God, meaning the kingdom of Jesus Christ, God in flesh, is being preached. And every man presseth into it. Okay, now, did you catch what you just read? John the Baptist 
is the end period of the Old Testament. His coming signifies, signals the Old Testament era is coming to an end. And now the New Testament era of the kingdom of God in flesh is upon us. Right? Now, John's father, Zechariah, he was an Aaronic priest, right, in Luke 1? Because he was a chief, he was a priest serving in the temple. And he was serving in the temple when Gabriel appeared to him, right? Let's see who is who is his mother, Elizabeth, Luke 1, 5. Luke 1, verse 5. So we're going to end it with this. Okay. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. These are all descendants of Aaron. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So notice John the Baptist is a full-blooded priest, Levite, descendant of Aaron, right? Right? He's a descendant of Aaron, and he is a priest. Now, write down these chapters. I don't have time to go into them. If you read Exodus chapter 29 onwards, at your own leisure, read Exodus 29 onwards, and then write down, write this down, Numbers chapter 4, verse 3. Numbers chapter 4, verse 35. Numbers chapter 4, verse 43. There it says, priest had to be 30 years of age and upward to serve in the temple. They had to be sons of Aaron, right? And the high priest and his sons had to be bathed in water, right? And anointed with oil as part of their consecration for their priestly duties, right? Notice, washed in water, anointed with oil, 30 years and up. Go to Luke 3. Luke 3, 21 to 23. Luke 3, 21 to 23. Luke 3, 21 to 23. Now, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open. And the Holy Ghost ascended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. So notice, Jesus is around 30 years old. He gets baptized in water by John the Baptist, and he's anointed with the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts 10.38. Same author wrote Luke, wrote Acts. Acts 10, 38. Read Acts 10, 37 and 38. Acts 10, 37 and 38. Acts 10, 37, 38. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, anointed him. Went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Notice what the qualification of priest and the high priest were. You got to be at least 30 years old, bathed in water, anointed with oil. Jesus was around 30 years old. Bathed in water, anointed by the Holy Spirit, under the authority of a Levitical priest, a son of Aaron, John the Baptist. In other words, John the Baptist, the Aaronic priest, was consecrating Jesus for his priesthood and passing on the baton. He goes, my job was to prepare you, and now the Old Testament ends with me, and now everything begins with you. I pass on the baton to you. My job is done. You caught it? A legitimate high priest, because John was a legitimate high priest, because he was of Aaron, and he was a high priest. A legitimate priest consecrates Christ when he's 30, bathing him in water, and he gets anointed with the Holy Spirit, because this is his preparation for his priestly service. A Levitical priest, an Aaronic priest, 
is preparing the true high priest for his mission. He goes, I've done my part. It ends with me. All that was be behind me ends with me. And now you are the beginning of a new era, a new dispensation, a new covenant. Because you make all things new. You got it, Billy Mandalay. That's what made John the Baptist the greatest of all human beings up until that point because he was given the honor that all the prophets wished they were honored with, but they were not given that privilege. He was given the honor of consecrating God in flesh, the God-man. It's just because of his proximity to Jesus that made him great. And you're telling me this book is not supernatural. These books do not have one author, the triune God, that the God of the Bible is not real, and that Jesus isn't the God-man. That's what you're trying to convince me? After all these proofs and evidence, if you guys still doubt God is real, Jesus is alive, and death is not the end of us, and the Bible is his book, then you truly, I truly deserve the punishment that God will inflict on us if we turn away. Right? So with that said, part three is done. This is my second session for today. You know, hopefully pray now. It's a new year. Pray we get more people, that this channel explode, that the Holy Spirit will continue to give me more wisdom, more knowledge, more understanding, more depth of Scripture. Illuminate all of us and give us the power to live the Word, not just hear it, proclaim it, but live it, love it, Proclaim it, defend it, and die for it. To become more like Jesus, to be more loved with Jesus, and more faithful to Jesus. And to finish the race in the power of the Holy Spirit until the Lord calls us home or until he returns. So subscribe, hit the like button, rewatch these sessions, download them, use them, proclaim them, and do pray for the provisions and pray for miraculous deliverance from my shackles and pray for my daughters, my two gifts that the Lord will bring them and they'll be in my arms sooner than later. And that will finish the race for the glory of Christ. And guys, like I said, this month, the support was a little down because I think it was Christmas and New Year's pray for it to increase so I can do this for his glory and pray Lord willing. I'll be in my new place by February 15. If God opens that door blessing, and Lord willing, I'll see you this week. If not tomorrow, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah in the flesh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And until you return, seal us by your spirit. Seal my daughters by your spirit. Wash us in your blood and fill us with your love to be always in love with you, son of God. Yep. You can contribute on PayPal to my email, sam underscore s-h-m-n at hotmail.com or in my Patreon pages, Shamunian or Shamun, Shamunian or Shamun. But I'm going to try to change the Patreon account to Christ for the World in due course. So pray for that. Love you guys. And more importantly, Jesus loves you more. Take care.